Hello, I'd just like to share with you my experience regarding uh, fixing my TV and just to give you a little bit of an insight on the background and what happened. I bought the TV in October of 2012 and it was running pretty fine up until uh, November of 2014 when all of a sudden it wouldn't turn on anymore. So I didn't know what was the problem. I took it down, I opened it up and the first thing I noticed, which was quite obvious, was there was a fuse on the board that was blown. And so I went to the electronic shop, showed them the fuse, they got me a new one, and uh, little did I know that you shouldn't really just put a fuse in, but I put it in anyway, and guess what? It just blew one second after I, powered, I plugged it in, and once again, TV was not working. So really, it's uh, annoying because I know now the fuse is not an issue. The fuse just keeps blowing. Uh, you know, I've even replacing more fuses, it would just keep blowing and blowing. So something deeper is going on with this TV, which would not allow it to power up. And it only lasted for two years. So there's some major issue, and it, you know, it's really upsetting. It's a model Philips uh, 22 PFL 4507. Not the most expensive TV in the world. They're quite cheap, small, uh, but. You know what, this can happen with any size TV and uh, really it's good to know this technique because you can save yourself hundreds if not thousands of dollars uh, to try to fix your TVs if you learn how to troubleshoot properly. So I opened up the back of the TV. Here's a shot of the back. You can see two boards. Uh, the one that's green is more related to the, uh, the video audio decoding and, and all of that tuner stuff. The real main problem is on the power supply board which is the one that you see sort of in an orange color and there's a transformer in the middle of it there. So I'm going to zoom in on that. That's the power board as you can see. And uh, there's a close-up shot. Um, you know, really looking grossly at all the components, there's nothing really majorly wrong. Nothing looks like it's burnt or blown up or in the wrong place. Uh, except for the fuse. If you look down in the corner, you'll see that the fuse does have some darkness around it. So that was how I noticed that it was a blown fuse. And so I thought maybe just putting a new fuse in would work, but it didn't. Uh, it just blew another one. And if I put in another fuse, it would blow that one as well. So obviously the fuse was not the source of the problem. It was just a symptom. So that's important to know. S if a fuse blows on a device, it's really important to make an effort to find other parts that are faulty. Don't just place, replace the fuse because what may happen is you will get other parts um, in your system um, sort of a cascading failure because you'll just keep juicing up your device with electricity every time you change the fuse it'll have another rush of current in there before the fuse blows again it may damage yet another part so what can cause that kind of thing to happen well a lot of times short circuits in the board um, will allow the current to travel through quickly burning out the fuse uh, some components that fail like MOSFETs diodes and so on will fail short uh, other components may fail with a break. So for example, uh, like a light bulb burns out, that opens the circuit. That's a break. Other components, when they blow or they burn out, they short out and they become a, a non-resistive path of, circ of uh, electricity and that's why you get too much current and your fuse keeps blowing. So I'm looking at the board. You know, this is the back side of it. Uh, still, nothing really obvious that I can see. There's a, a few components on the back, but most of them are on the front side, the orange part, which is, as you can see right here. Um, now, there's no obvious visible damage, but that's the first thing you'd look at. You know, I was suspecting maybe the capacitor had an issue with it, but nothing really that I could see. So I go to my resource that I, uh, I encourage all of you to check out, eevblog.com. Uh, the forums there are very helpful. There's a lot of great advice from experts around the world that uh, all of us have an interest and a hobby in electronics. And I believe, uh, you know, without their help, this wouldn't have been possible at all. So I, I really thank them. Uh, first thing I did was I downloaded the schematics. Luckily enough, they were available and I found them on Google doing a search. Uh, so you kind of wonder if you can find it that easily. Maybe there is a problem majorly with this system and these power supplies are known to be quite badly designed. It looks like they're used in a lot of TVs and therefore a lot of people have had to troubleshoot and diagnose and fix their TVs and many of them have made the manuals available. So this is a look at the power board. Essentially uh, you have various components that you can look at. Um, there's um, you know things that you need to check your components like a multimeter an ESR meter comes in handy for checking capacitors or you can get a component tester uh, as well that will help you check transistors and diodes and so on. 
So these are the tools I had, the multimeter I had laying around, the component tester I actually bought just for this fix. I found it uh, quite cheaply and I thought it would be helpful, so it's another tool in my toolbox for the future. Turns out it was just $15 on eBay. I have a separate video that I'm going to link to this. Uh, if you click on that uh, box there over the, the tester, you'll be able to see the other video. So the only issue is that you need to desolder most of your components to check. Uh, you have to take them off your board, plug them in, press the little button, see if you know what it tells you. Uh, it's hard to test a lot of these components inside of the circuit because the fact that it's connected to other things leads to erroneous results. So you really have to know the circuit well. So the other thing you'll need is a soldering iron, obviously, so you can remove components carefully, check them, and put them back. Now, there's extra clues that are available if you want to figure out how to fix your TV. For example, the service manual had a lot of parts next to it with a little um, exclamation mark and a triangle symbol, a caution symbol. So those, if you look at the fine detail, it usually says that if a fuse blows, check those components first. Because I believe they know if when fuses blow, those tend to be the parts that have a problem. The other clue is that there are repair kits online that are available, and they usually list the most common parts that fail, and the usually the kit com comes with pretty much 90% of the parts that usually fail, you'll just take the kit, replace all of the parts, and usually your TV will work again. Now, it doesn't mean all of the, c the, com the components that are in the kit have failed on your particular board, but it's a good clue as to where to check first. So shopjimmy.com, I went on there. They tend to have a lot of repair kits. I found one for my TV. It turns out that it's not just my TV, but Emerson, Magnavox, Philips, as you can see there, plus a whole lot of other TV brands and models use the exact same power supply. And they sell a kit with the most common components, or you can actually buy a board directly. I thought it would be a little more fun, although I did take a risk of uh, replacing the components individually. Uh, and you know, rather than buying an entire board, it was a little cheaper to, to buy the components, maybe $15. Uh, but it took a lot of work and effort to sit there and do everything versus buying a brand new power board um, which would have cost maybe $35 and I wouldn't have to think at all. I would just swap one board out for the other. Uh, but again, you have those different options. So you can either buy the components kit or the full board. So I got the component kit uh, online. I looked at the components first just to see what it is exactly that they're replacing and that gave me, that gave me a clue. These are the most common components uh, that probably have caused the failure. You can see there the fuse, obviously, and then there's 13 other parts, uh, one resistor, three transistors, eight diodes, and one capacitor that may be faulty. So I started looking at the schematic diagram. Here's the schematic uh, part of the power supply that shows the hot circuit that goes directly into the AC plug. And right up in the top there, you can see the fuse, you know, immediately uh, after the, the, um, the AC cord. That's part F601, or it's marked on the circuit board. You can find a lot of these things easily, but just by reading the uh, print on the circuit board. There are four rectifying diodes, number D601 to D604, that were there, um, and that basically uh, creates a rectifying bridge. Those are also included in the kit, so I went to check those as well. And then below, I'm just uh, sliding down to the next part of the schematic. Down the page, you'll notice another circuit with a bunch of components. The capacitor is included as well. That's in the kit. There's also a FET transistor at Q501. There's a MOSFET at Q601. And there's also a transistor at Q602. All of those happen to be also in the, um, the kit. There's a Zeno diode at D607 and one at 608. There happens to be also a diode at 609. And a resistor and an SMD diode. So there's quite a lot of pieces on this particular part of the board um, that, you know, if I didn't really have any idea where to look, I could be wasting a lot of time here. Still, it's a good idea to check every other component here as well. There's probably another dozen or so parts, but those ones there, I may have not even checked, uh, you know, if I didn't think of it, I would have possibly just found one or two things I thought were wrong, then think thought that that was it change them and then ended up getting the fuse blowing again and having those parts blow again. So it's a good idea to change everything that you can possibly uh, first check and then change every possible thing that may be wrong. So the kit helped me figure out which parts to check and also to test. I confirmed it on my TV. I thought, you know what, 
some were bad, some were good. I'm better buy the kit. So I paid $15, I ordered it, it arrived. Here it is in a bag uh, in the box. And I went ahead, they were all labeled. I started to desolder my components. And sure enough, you know, this, the, it wasn't too difficult to do, but it did take some time. There you can see some more components. Uh, it is difficult to do a nice job, and uh, especially if you have, um, you know, s these small components, you want to be careful not to, to ruin your board. That was what I was afraid of, but, uh, you know, if you're careful, you can change it. And here's the result. You can see uh, all the parts that were in the kit I replaced, and these are all the parts that were on the board that I took out. I tested all of them again, and just to confirm, the ones on the left-hand side were testing bad, so there are at least... Um, six components there that actually were bad. The other ones I changed anyway. There were another seven components, as you can see there, including the capacitor, that seemed to test good, but I wasn't going to take the risk. So, and I, I ended up, anyway, I bought the uh, component kit, so I just changed all of them as a matter of fact. And uh, the next step was to power it on. Now, before I did that, just a, a quick uh, aside here about component quality. The original Philips part was a Suscon, obviously not the greatest uh, quality brand. I checked online, I couldn't really find much about them. Everyone seems to suggest Nikicon is the best uh, brand or, or one of the better brands. And so you really, you know, really want to hang your hat on good quality components. When you make the things out of bad quality components, you're going to get problems. So you want to replace it with something good. Now. Again, with help from people on the EEV blog, um, four members suggested that I don't just plug the TV straight in. One thing to do is to use what's called a dim bulb tester, and that's instead of what's called a variac. So it's a s essentially a way to get your TV powered up slowly with limiting the current so that you don't blow anything. Uh, you'll be able to tell if there's a problem again, perhaps with the fuse, without um, having the TV uh, get too much of a rush of current. So I built one of these things, uh, which I can use for future fixes. Uh, and so it might cost a bit to fix, to, to build one, it's about $20, $30 to build this one. I happen to not have the, all the parts, so I went to buy them. Uh, it's essentially um, a light switch that uh, switches on a light bulb and a socket, which you plug your TV into. There's the outlet light bulb and switch. I'm going to give you a little review of how it works. Essentially, uh, you plug the your your dim bulb tester into the wall and your switch is going to be in the off position so, and you plug your TV or radio or whatever you want to test into the outlet and you have a, a socket for a bulb that goes in between your switch and your outlet that essentially uh, has the electricity pass in series through to the outlet so when you don't have a light bulb in there it doesn't matter what you plug in the outlet it doesn't work even when you turn the switch on and off so you have to plug a bulb in to complete the circuit. You start with a 25 watt bulb or something quite small so that it's very low current. What will happen is um, you know, when you have the electricity passing through a 25 watt bulb, it will limit the current going to your TV. And when you turn it on, if the TV has a short in it or there's a problem you know, still on your board, you'll notice the bulb light up and it'll stay lit as if the, the radio or TV was a complete short. And what you're looking for is the bulb to light up and then sort of dim again. And uh, so it looks like there's something else drawing current in the circuit. So it's testing your load. You should really have some resistive load on your TV or whatever comp device you plug it in, which will dim your bulb. So if that tests fine, you go up to a 40 watt bulb, then a 60 watt bulb, and slowly you increase the bulb wattage until you know you, your TV powers up. When I used the 25 watt bulb, it didn't power up because it was just too little current. I did see a standby light and it did go up and down a little bit, but it wasn't enough to boot the whole TV up and running. But when I switched it to a 40 and then a 60 watt, I had no problems. So there we go. I had the bulb go in. There you can see it running. Uh, the TV's plugged into the my dim bulb tester. I flipped the switch. My bulb went up bright for a second and then dimmed. And that's about a 60 watt bulb, but it does not look like a 60 watt bulb. As you can see, the filament is barely glowing red. And that's because the TV, of course, is uh, resistive load. It's drawing some current, but it's not a short. So that just um, helped to confirm everything was fine. So that's how I fixed my TV. I just wanted to show you the steps uh, because you can do it too. 
you know, just if you have the dedication and commitment to learn a bit and uh, get online and uh, participate with some of the members in the forums, they're very helpful. Uh, and you can really troubleshoot a lot of things and work through problems. And it's really, you know, it's a pity that TVs today only last two years. It's really a shame. I have another video that I did about my Samsung fixing the capacitor there. It's really just a waste of money. Even though these are cheap TVs, uh, even the more expensive ones have these issues. So y you may have a TV that costs you close to $1,000. It really shouldn't end up in the landfill in only two years. And, you know, by buying more and more of these TVs and not standing up to these companies, you know, we're just rewarding poor quality and design. And, you know, nobody seems to care because they figure TVs are disposable items. But it's time to stop the insanity. You know, learn to fix your TVs. It's usually easy. A lot of times you can find very simple problems, capacitors that are blown or a couple of very simple components that cost maybe a few pennies. Uh, you know, you can even buy kits online to fix boards and stuff for nothing. Parts are cheap and they're ubiquitous. You know, you can even find a lot of TVs people throw away, dumpster dives, you know, that where people are throwing TV after TV, usually, or monitors, they're just a small little component wrong. You fix it and you got 100, 200 bucks right there. So really, you can make a lot of money learning some simple skills as well. So I just hope you enjoyed this video. And uh, if you liked it, uh, please give me a thumbs up on YouTube and uh, looking forward to doing more. Thanks again. Bye-bye.